Hello and welcome to another episode of the Sleep Nanny podcast. Today I have the pleasure of being joined by Sarah Almond Bushell. She is a registered dietitian and a paediatric feeding therapist. Sarah is your lady when it comes to dealing with those fussy eaters and all things food and I cannot wait to delve into this episode. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's a topic that I love to talk about. So it's my pleasure to be here. Fantastic. Oh, I can't wait. There are so many things I want to ask you on behalf of our audience. And generally, um, this is something I wish I had known a lot more about when my two were small um, and a topic that I think you know people don't always put their hand up and say when feeding is a struggle. Mm. And I, I do remember the days where I would be almost in tears in the kitchen just going what what do I do if yeah. you know it would, if they're not he won't eat this and what if I try that and what's right and what's not and yeah it's um it, it can be draining so hopefully today you'll be able to share some brilliant wisdom and um and help our audience with all of these things oh awesome yeah absolutely and I, I totally can you know relate to that because despite being a pediatric dietitian and I think I'd been working for about 10 years before my first baby came along I still struggled with a fussy eater and my second one was even worse so I okay. totally get it as as a mum as well as a professional yeah yeah amazing and I think that's that's the thing when we are mums and professionals we we have that first-hand experience too which helps us to relay it in a way that parents understand you know we we know what you're going through and we yes. know what it feels like yes definitely so before we really get delved in Sarah just tell us a little bit about your journey into this speciality like what what brought you into this in the first place yeah absolutely so um First things first, I'm very old. Oh no, you're not. <laughs> I've been um, I've been working in this area for 25 years, um, and I did 22 years in the NHS. And um, I got into pediatrics quite early on. So when we qualify, we qualify in everything. Um, but I had a boss who was absolutely amazing, and she said to me, Sarah, you know what are you interested in? And I thought, well, at that point, I'd been working on like the elderly care wards and. Um, you know, helping cancer patients. And although it was fulfilling, it was actually a bit boring. And uh, so I thought, you know what? Pediatrics could be quite fun because at least you get to play. So that was my motivation really to get started. Um, and I never looked back. So out of those 25 years, 24 of them have been in pediatrics. Wow. Um, and what I really love about that is it's fun. You can be creative. Um, your colleagues are just um, so lovely because everybody comes to it with that sense of just understanding about children and child development. And so there's always that play spin on things, which, yeah, it's just a really nice place to be. Yeah, definitely. So it's been a long time. You're definitely you are definitely the pro in this area. Um, and I'm sure in that time. So with pediatrics, just take, tell me like what age range does that cover because I don't I don't know if I really know the answer to that question <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah and and sorry that's a bit of a medical term isn't it that's showing my um all my years in the hospital um so it's birth up to 19 so wow. right through um and so it, it is really quite broad mm. um so what I've done and, and obviously you know when you work in the NHS and in hospitals and things you see anybody and everybody who needs your help which is brilliant I love that but when it comes to my business if you try and do that you're talking to everybody aren't you yeah so I specialized initially in baby and weaning and um starting solids and things like that and then what I found is my audience obviously grew grew up so now most of my people are sort of toddlers preschoolers um even some like primary school age children so I would say roughly now I focus my time on sort of 18 months to about 10. Yeah yeah and do you think in that in your work now do you find that there's um many at the older end of that 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 struggle is it is different I imagine isn't it because I would imagine it goes from behavioral earlier on through to more habitual I'm purely guessing I'm not a pro in this but I'm sort of picturing like in the early stages the behavioral aspects will form the habits and then when they become that 
sort of in older childhood, um, they may be fussy due to habit rather than yeah, yeah, genuine. Um, yeah, I. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting actually because um, so the causes of fussy eating are not parenting. So the, you know, one of the first things I try and get across to uh, mums and dads is that it's not their fault; they haven't done anything to cause their children to be fussy. Mm. But you're absolutely right. If children have become fussy for you know one of a number of reasons, often the things that we do as parents, be, out of sheer desperation, because we really just want to nourish these little people and essentially keep them alive that's where those habits form yeah. um and so yeah some of my clients you know they'll they might have a nine ten year old and I often say to them you know it's going to be harder and it's going to take longer for you than it is for the next person who's got an 18 month old because mm -hmm. there's so much unlearning that we have to do and there's a lot of the psychological cues that they've learned essentially what they've learned is when you sit down at the dinner table you don't eat and we have to get them to learn that actually when you sit down at the dinner table, you do eat. So it's, it's a lot of undoing that we have to do with the older children. Mm, I, I imagine so. That was one of my questions, actually, um, that I wanted to ask you about little ones and, and sort of fussy eating, because we all know how they're all different, right? And they all have their own unique personalities. And I'm sure there'll be parents listening to this who have more than one child and will think, well, you know, this one's great. They eat all these things and this one really is much more fussy and and they'll be thinking but I did everything the same I I you know I, I served up the same meals and so on um which led me to you know wondering about what you were just touching on there which is parenting and how much of fussy eating comes from personality and how much comes from our our methods with parenting yeah um, I I do worry honestly that I I set some bad habits up because I think well I thought nope don't like that okay what else what else and kept kind of coming back with different options yeah. and had I stood firm with this is your food if you don't eat it there's nothing else would I have had a you know less fussy eater and yeah it's a minefield <laughs> yeah yeah and I think the answer to that question is pro is probably yes because that's exactly what happened so they so when they're when they're quite little um the main reason why parents think their child is a fussy eater is actually down to growth and development. So, mm -hmm. you know, when they're, when they're under one, they eat quite a lot and pretty much everything, actually, you, you know, even broccoli that makes them pull a funny face, they will eventually learn to, to like that and they accept food. And then when they get to about one, they, uh, their nutritional requirements drop because that massive growth spurt has slowed right down. And so this baby who would consume anything and everything, as well as all of their milk feeds, suddenly doesn't. And so that's the first thing that parents go, oh my goodness, they're not eating enough, they're not eating enough. And, they, and it causes a real anxiety, which you totally get. It can be like from one day to the next, really. And then, of course, they enter this um, developmental phase, the next sort of developmental leap that they go through leads to something, um, and it's a brain development, actually, it leads to something in their brain called uh, neophobia. And so this is where they develop a true fear um, response to actually quite familiar food. So, you know, that sweet potato that they might have eaten beautifully as a baby, you'll suddenly present that and they'll burst into tears, they'll run away from the table and you can see the adrenaline inside them. They're absolutely terrified of this food. Um, and that can be with new foods that you try and get them to eat um, as well as familiar foods. So you've got those two things kind of happening at the same sort of time. Mm. Um, and that's when most of most people come to me and say I've got a fussy eater I've tried absolutely everything and when you ask them what they've tried it is all of those things it's like the rewards um the just one more bite um it's restriction cutting out snacks to see if they eat a bit more at dinner time um distractions things like the ipad having that on in front of them to almost like distract them so you can shovel a spoonful in um, and then also things like indulging children so by that I mean it's um, you prepare the food that you know they like because they'll eat it rather mm. than food that you know that they probably should be having from a health and nutrition point yeah. of view.
Yeah. I'm so guilty of all of those things. <laughs> we all like, are. We all are. <laughs> to the point that I even remember when my, because mine are quite close in age, and when they were tiny, I can still remember doing all kinds of performances in the kitchen with <laughs> celebrations and little, like, um, not licking kind of games and just things to get them sort of happy and enjoying the experience rather than rejecting the food but when I look back I think my goodness the energy I had to put into that um <laughs> and and I'm not even sure it worked <laughs> to be honest um but that you know it's really interesting and, and would I, I definitely noticed um and I know my mum had this with my younger brother as well um a difference when it came to a change in texture so going from sort of puree very early baby like weaning to which I think is different these days. I think there's a lot more encouragement for um, uh, finger foods right from the start. But yeah. back then it was much, it was like, okay, start with puree, then then put some lumpy things in. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we shifted from pu like completely smooth to lumpy, all hell broke loose. <laughs> it was a big yeah. problem. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, that is a little bit of a myth as well, that if you do baby led weaning, you won't have a fussy eater. I hear that all the time um, and I can kind of get it, but they're still going to grow, go through that growth dip and they're still going to go through that neophobia developmental phase. So you've still got, you know, other things there. Mm. But one of the main reasons for fussy eating is um, sensory. So it's yeah. the sensory preferences probably for most children but then there are some children that have sensory processing issues as well where it's just really really unpleasant when they eat so and, and I think sensory is something that's not really talked about very much because it's not a diagnosis it's not a health problem so when parents think that they've got a fussy eater and you know they go to the GP and they f feel like they've been fobbed off it's often because there isn't a diagnosis to give. And so there is no NHS services for this. Mm. So, um, but I mean, we've all got our own sensory preferences. You know, that's why we like things and we don't like other things. But sometimes with children, they can be, they, they, their sensory preferences can, or their sensory differences, I should say, can be where they either just don't even notice that the the food is there. So some children almost are a little bit blasé. They might um, never appear to have an appetite, never appear to be hungry, and they've just got fairly low registration to the senses. And then you've got other children who are um, sensory seekers who actually can't get enough. And they're the kids that you see who've got like spaghetti bolognese in their hair and food all around their mouths, and they don't even seem to notice it. And And, you know, they're, they're the kids who really get involved with with food. Um, and then there's and, and the other thing just to say about sensory as well is we assume that there's only five senses, but there's actually eight. Um, mm. And those extra three senses are all involved in eating as well. So one is about balance. And if you can't um, balance, if you don't feel secure in your seat, for example, um, your body's number one priority is to sustain life. So it's going to try and hold you upright. And if you're spending all of your energy being held upright, you haven't really got much energy to learn about the food in front of you. Mm. So one's balance. One is interoception, which is the feelings inside your body, like hunger, like thirst. Um, sometimes children just don't even recognize those. Um, and then the other one is proprioception. So that is where humans adults and children know where things are without seeing so for example if you were to if you were to be sat at the table and you had food in front of you and you closed your eyes you'd still be able to pick up that piece of food and get it into your mouth even though you can't see it so mm -hmm. it's like an awareness of where your body is yeah. so if any one of those eight senses is slightly off it can have a real impact on mm -hmm. on eating yeah yeah, that's fascinating, actually. Gosh, the the extra things that we don't even see or think about. But I imagine there are lots of little ones that are, like you say, unbalanced or being held in a certain position and don't have that real grounded feeling of um, security yeah. from which to then explore the foods. And um, I'm, I can pit that one. I can picture straight away. Um, yeah, yeah, so a tip I can give for your listeners is just to have a look at 
high chairs or even you know they're out of high chairs and sitting on adult chairs can they have they got somewhere where they can press down with their feet because often high chairs just leave little legs dangling and if they mm. haven't got that stability where they can push down with their feet that mm. um that's that vestibular sense is just not supported adequately enough to be able to you know deal with a job in hand that's so fascinating Honestly, to think that a simple thing like that can give them such a better sense of security yes. um, and focus on their food. That's, yeah. So just going back to, we're talking about distractions, um, yes. iPads, me doing songs and dances around the kitchen. Um, is that, I'm, I'm presuming that that's not a good idea because it's, you know, they, they're not then learning about or aware of in the same sense, we talk about this in a sleep context where they're, if they're not aware of falling to sleep, they don't adjust to doing it and have that, you know, sensation through their body. So, um, yeah, is the advice to remove distractions at meal times and have the, the food as the main focus? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think, I think we have to be realistic here and we are parents and sometimes it's quite nice to go out for dinner where an iPad's actually quite handy to take with you. Yeah. <laughs> we will die. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. So because because learning to eat is a sensory thing, children mm -hmm. have to be able to see it, they have to be able to smell it, they have to be able to feel the food. And if they're distracted because they're watching something on their screen, um, they don't get to do that. So it's almost like mindless eating rather than mm -hmm. being mindful with, with food. So yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can imagine that and that just leads to more problems when they get older and, and being fussy, but then also still seeking those distractions, which you and I have teenagers and we know what that's like in in those years with all the distractions that they have anyway. Um, yeah, definitely. So yeah. let's go to the start. Like for parents that are listening to this that are right at the beginning, maybe their little ones haven't even begun solid yet or maybe they're at the early stages. Um, I would love to almost rewind there myself and go like, what? let's look at what can parents do right from the beginning, um, sort of simple things that can encourage healthy eating and avoid those fussy, what would be the main tips you would suggest? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's a really beautiful philosophy called the division of responsibility in feeding. Um, and essentially it's, it's a, it's, written by a lady called Ellen Satter, who's a, a family therapist and a dietitian in the US, just to give full credit there, it's not mine. Um, and what she has described is the feeding relationship. So the relationship between the child and the parent. So the parent's role is to decide on what the food's gonna be. And I think this is really key because loads of parents will say to their children, what do you want for dinner tonight? Children can't make that decision because their nutritional knowledge is terrible. So parents' role is to decide what's on the menu. Um, the parents' role is also to decide on where that food's going to be eaten. So whether you're going to be sat at the table, have you got the appropriate seating, as we've talked about. Um, actually, today, we're going to have a picnic in the park. So you're deciding on that and not letting your little one go and eat something in front of the TV or wander off halfway through. And then the third thing is the when, and the when is about the structure. So I don't tend to use the word routine because I don't like people to think they have to eat at exactly 12, 15 on a Monday, you know, but it's more like a rhythm. So there's a predictable rhythm for meal, snack, meal, snack, meal throughout the day. And a lot of that is to help little ones um, feel reassured that there, there is something coming. And it also prevents that perpetual, can I have a snack? Can I have a snack? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because they know what to expect. They, they know it's happening. Mm -hmm. So that's the parent's job. And that's it, that's it, their job's done after that. And then the child's job is to decide if to eat, because sometimes they don't. And as you know, when they go through that sort of toddler fussy stage and their nutritional requirements drop down, their appetite goes as well. And that's okay, they can make the decision to eat or not eat. Um, and also when they do eat to decide when they're finished, because I think so many of us We'll look at what they've eaten and think, well, that's not enough to sustain a bird. Go on, just have one more bite. Or, you know, you've had no protein today. Can you just eat the chicken? And that's where we get really, um, we start to apply a little bit of pressure. It's It comes from a good place and it's, it's positive pressure, but the child perceives that as negative, like 
nagging essentially um, and what happens is when that pressure is applied um, adrenaline levels spike and when you've got high adrenaline your appetite just switches off dead so it like it ends the meal and that's why you end up with that drama and you know stress at the dinner table yeah. so you know going back to your question there about what can they do right from day one it's that so yeah. parents provides child decides yeah and so it's being okay with it's being okay with throwing it in the bin and going yeah. they're not going to eat that okay done. yeah move yeah. on and from about 18 months rather than pre-plating your children's meals what I, what I love people to do is put put the component parts in the center of the table and then encourage your child to serve themselves so mm. yes initially they will make mistakes and they'll take too much or they'll spill the peas or you know it'll be a bit of a mess and that's fine the kids they're learning but um by doing that they then get to learn how much can my body or does my body need so they get a really good idea of learning what a portion means to them mm. um so i think sometimes you know because i suppose as adults we have very set um public health information about what portion sizes are for 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 us to be healthy but it's quite different for children so you can have an idea of what a portion might look like in terms of what you're going to cook and what you might put on on the table but what they take might be something completely different or even none at all mm. yeah i just i really like that and i think giving them that feeling of control yeah. Um, and taking away that force I think like you say it comes from a good place and I know that for me it was like oh come on please eat so you're, you're not gonna have anything <laughs> but actually all right they don't they won't starve themselves and I think it's that fear though of okay but if you miss this meal and then you're gonna want the snacks and and a child then living on snacks and not getting the nutrition from the meals and I think that's the frustration I still see that even now with mm -hmm. mine at older ages where it's like but if you if you just fill up on snacks and then you don't want the meal then you're going to be hungry again and then you're going to seek snacks again so yeah so my counter to that is how are you do are you playing your role as the parent and deciding what the snack is because again no. <laughs> snacks usually packets aren't they things that they can grab usually particularly for young children they've got like chase from Paw Patrol on the front or you know something that really appeals to them mm. but actually a snack should really be like a mini meal so I often say to people you know with a meal you might try and get some carbs and some fruit and veg and some protein and a bit of dairy with a snack try and go for three of them so you're not having to do the, the you know all five food groups but you want at least three Mm. And tiny portions so that they're not going to be full up, but it means that the nutrition part is covered and and mm. um, and they, they, the snack is not a treat. That's really valid. I think snacks do appear like treats. And like you say, partly because of packaging, even yeah. if they are like really wholesome, healthy things inside, but they do have that kind of treat um vibe about them don't they yeah um, and and you know what i think this is absolutely fascinating but food manufacturers know about the sensory side of things and they know that a, a food has to be visually accepted before a child will ever go on to smell it interact with it touch it whatever so that's why they make their packaging really really visually appealing mm. so that the child wants it wants it wants it wants it nags the parent going around the supermarket and it's why you know, when you go to the supermarket, those lovely bright colours with Chase from Paw Patrol is right at child height, not up mm -hmm. there where the parents can see it. It's right down there. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're crafty, these food manufacturers. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. And and even I think some of the things that are in things. So one of my children really likes the um, those Kellogg's winders. And it's, you know, it, I'm sure it's highly sugary um but they're you know, made to look like it's fruit and so it's yeah. some form of fruit thing I mean I honestly think of it more of a sweet treat it's yeah. it's not um nutritional um but again it's that oh it feels like a snack and it yeah I think reframing snacking is a great concept I'm liking like the idea of that so if you rather than thinking snacks are some sweet treat or something that's going to fill them up and then they were not going to eat their main meals 
factoring and being the parent and deciding this is the choice of snacks. These are, these are the, you know, this is what we've cut class as a snack. And yeah. then having that as a, as you say, mini meal. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Brilliant. And what it does is it makes that snack less desirable. It's no longer on the pedestal up there, you know, as being the thing that they really, really want. It's just, it's just the thing that you do at three o'clock in the afternoon, every single day. Mm. And and with that, you know, I like the dual control here because as, as the parent, you decide what the food is, but as they become old enough to, they can decide what they put on their plate, for instance, yeah. from the selection that you give them. And it's the same as all the boundaries as parents that we set. You know, we like to go, these are your choices, but you've given them a you know, parameter yes. from which they can choose. So, yeah. yeah. And if you think about it, what you're doing in these sort of early years is you're um, empowering children so that, you know, you, we said earlier, we've both got teenagers when they go out with their own money and they're starting to make these food decisions for themselves, you can imagine some children will, you know, be buying chips and um, other less healthy things and other kids will go and get a meal deal from a supermarket with a sandwich and some fruit and some water and, you know, and actually make it more of a sort of balanced meal. Mm. And a lot of that... Um, a lot of that work is what we do in the early years so that when it comes to that stage and they are autonomous, they, they know what to do. That sounds like the dream because I totally know that my 13-year-old son will go out with his friends and probably consume Burger King, Subway and Five Guys <laughs> in one sitting. <laughs> but they're 13-year-old boys. Um, they all see that you know, they're, they're just seeing freedom, freedom, freedom. and also massive growth spurt at that age as well. So we probably need the calories from all of those. <laughs> yeah, I have to say I have seen that with a yeah with a teenage boy. The where it goes, I have no idea. And they're um yeah, him and some of his friends, they are lean. They're in good shape. They're physically fit and healthy. But where they put the food, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Um, if only, if only I could do the same. Um, <laughs> so what about then when we have another experience that I've been through, and I know lots of parents will, where their children are in daycare or, you know, nursery kind of settings and they're getting feedback and, you know, different reports of how they are with food in different environments. Um, I know there were things that I could never get my children to eat, but they would eat at nursery. But then I know there were some foods that they would just never eat anywhere mm -hmm. um no matter no matter what and then I do remember nursery they to this day they have memories of bad memories of being told or shamed um because they didn't want to try certain things um presumably we need to work with our daycare providers and and let them know what our preferences are with how they treat food and our children but um yeah I mean what what can you share around that sort of conundrum and how to yeah. navigate that yeah so it's a couple of points there so I think you're right you know we need to work with these people who are looking after our children but there's actually no decent official guidelines for food or nutrition around nursery meals and there's certainly nothing around the food parenting side of things mm -hmm. so what I was saying before about you know parents decide parents provide child decides that hasn't necessarily filtered down to nurseries unless there's somebody there who's got a keen interest and gone and found that out for themselves. Mm -hmm. So um, so it's often it's up to us as parents to educate the people who are looking after our, our children. Um, in one of my programmes, actually, I, this was, became a, a, a problem a few years ago. And I remember writing a lunchbox card where it said in there, you know, my child is allowed to eat the food that they want in the order that they want to eat it up to the amount that they've decided, please do not tell them what to eat. Because this parent was saying to me that, you know, their child had to eat their sandwich first. And then only after that could they go on to their yogurt. And you're thinking, you know, that's not the message that we want to be sharing. We want to be teaching children that all food is equal, really. Mm. Um, so there's that. But the other thing that I just wanted to say here, and this is another thing that really fascinates me, is loads and loads and loads of people say, oh, well, they'll eat that at nursery, but they won't eat it at home. Or they'll eat it at granny's house and she'll package it up for me and I'll bring it home and I'll heat it up and it's exactly the same food, but they will not eat it at home. <laughs> yeah. And what's going on there 
is and this is bringing it right back to where we started around the the habits and the psychology that goes on around feeding Mm -hmm. so the cues at granny's house and the cues at nursery are often conditioned to facilitate eating so there's often at nursery it's often that there's a lot of social stuff going on there's loads of children trying different things you know so they sit down at nursery and they they know what you do now is you eat whereas at home especially if they've had a lot of that sort of pressure and restriction and rewards and nagging essentially what they've conditioned themselves to is at home i don't eat because I get an adrenaline spike and it switches my appetite off. Mm. So I just think that's a really, really fascinating thing. And so one of the first things that we do with all of our families is we change the cues. So we just change up the cues so that food at home is no longer associated with not not eating. Mm-hmm. Mm. And how? How do we change how do we change those cues though? Because I'm thinking yeah. that makes complete sense, but if I were in the moment, I would be going, okay, I get that. But what do I do? What do I do to change that if it's already a pattern and I've got a toddler that's, you know, coming home and and, it, and that is happening? Yeah, it can be really, really simple. So it's so the cue can be absolutely anything. So um, one of the things we always say is change the position at the table. So if, if your child always has a certain seat, just put them to the opposite side. Move the table if that's something that you can do. If, say, um, you always wear an apron when you're cooking, just don't wear an apron. If you always have your hair down, tie it up. So mm. it could be anything. It could be the view out the window. It could be the picture on the wall. So we, what we'd normally do is we just say, make enough change so your child notices it and usually the seat is the big thing that they notice and then it and then the cues are different and it meal times become interesting oh why are we doing this and there'll be questions it could be um we're going to put some music on and actually we can give the little one the job of choosing the music so they have a little bit of buy-in as well yeah um it could be things like laying the table you know putting placemats out knives and forks and um you know it, it can be absolutely anything that's probably why they i know mine will make different choices even on holiday um yeah. or yeah. at a restaurant yeah. or yeah. Mm. yeah yeah holidays actually we often see people come back to us and say i can't believe it we've we've gone all inclusive and they've just gone to the buffet and they've eaten x y and z <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah i even remember my fussy my fussy boy um he must have been really young because i was pregnant with my daughter so and he, she was born when he was 21 months so he was under that age yeah. and we were abroad and he was just devouring everything on that trip. And we were, I remember being in a, a little restaurant and he, we got him a little bolognese and he just couldn't stop. He was going for it and loving it. And uh, whereas that, and I just remember thinking, I, and that's why I remember it. I remember it so clearly because it was such a like, wow moment because at home getting anything like that going was hard work. Yeah. They just would devour it. And like, okay, sure, change of pace, temperature and all these things and appetite. But it was just, there was just no, he was happy. He was delving in. And so, yeah, yeah. you're right. He, I was probably calmer. It was probably, yeah. you know, yeah. everything was probably. Yeah. And they do, they pick up on all those little things, don't they? So, you mm. know, if you're on holiday, you're mo- more likely to be relaxed. You're probably not too desperately worried if all the chips and salad for two weeks you know so it's it's it does have that knock-on effect yeah holidays are often the thing that people say makes a big difference the challenge I have now with holidays is getting the veg into them because I'm really like at home it's one of my things I've always made sure my children get plenty of vegetable like well not plenty variety they're quite particular of which ones but they get them in there and they and they do that does happen and when we yeah. travel it's often challenging because not quite the same and sometimes you can't get the veg that they want um and so yeah I do I do find that is a little bit of a challenge traveling and trying to find things to make sure that they are balanced and they're not just living on carbs and cheese (laughs) um overseas but yeah and I often think you know if it's a two-week holiday 
and you don't you're not going every single month it's not that big a deal you know mm. it's weeks out of their lives they can catch up on the veggies that they like when they get back when they get back yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so it'd be being relaxed about it and make keep make sure they're hydrated usually yes. you won't get too many um repercussions if you're yeah um so i've got to ask this is it ever too late to to course correct a fussy eater because i know with mine at nearly 12 and coming up 14 this autumn there are things i would love to change and i have friends who have kids who eat amazingly and I'm not surprised I know why because you, I can almost see the patterns you know a family I know where one of the parents is a fantastic chef cooks up wonderful foods there's so much variety the family are all involved mm. they don't sleep so I'm winning on that one <laughs> but <laughs> we all have the things they prior- we prioritize um but I know a lot of the challenges I've seen will be because I'm not a cook. I admit firsthand, you know, I do not enjoy cooking. Um, and I, I always want to shortcut that and keep it as simple as possible. Um, and I envy people who do, you know, have that love for it and can create because it's just not where my, my creative juices flow. Um, but that's all well and good. I can reflect all day long. But in terms of, does it become too ingrained? Um, at what point or what kinds of things can you do when they are a bit older or is it a case of choice because they want to make so many more decisions when they're um you know becoming young adults almost and yeah yeah, yeah. is there hope yeah. Sarah is there hope there absolutely is <laughs> and you know what one of the sort of like little side benefits that um we found over the years and it's almost laughable is it's nearly always and this is a huge generalisation in this day and age, but it's nearly always the mums who get in touch because they're desperately worried about their child and the dad's also a fussy eater. And what we find is the dad's fussy eating improves as well. Really? Yeah. So it's never too late. Mm. I think I think what what they what they kind of get is that they have to do it as well. So yeah. if they're going to sit down at the dinner table with their families at the weekends and share a meal and dad's not going to you know have any green veg on his plate their child's not going to improve and mm-hmm. so once the once the dad so, starts to buy in with the whole thing yeah their first eating improves as well I can see that totally <laughs> because I, I he'll, he'll say he's not, but I would say my husband is a fussy eater and he's the chef. So <laughs> it's, it's um, a bit of a, yeah, a bit of a cycle there for sure. I think, mm. you know, I did see this also sort of reflecting back to my younger brother. Um, he kind of started, he was about, how old was he? Maybe nine months or something. Um, obviously I was only a child, but I remember him in a high chair and he started putting his elbow up like this um for whenever food was coming his way and he just started to reject food and from a baby for years he barely barely ate anything he then started to eat in early childhood he would only eat like dry bread dry finger food if he, if he could pick it up and it was very plain he would eat it um so like dry bread rolls became his lunch um, it's re- it was really hard work and I remember introducing him to uh, I will take credit for introducing him to um, chips now I know that's not a healthy thing but I remember my mum and my older brother were in a fish and chip shop getting some chips and I thought I would t- I just told him a story that they were magic and that they were like crisps but you could change the flavor and um, he, he was like this sounds good and it was just a different texture and it was warm so I thought well I've done something good here yeah and then he started to eat pizza <laughs> um, but it's all very safe th- things He's now in his 30s, loves cooking, is always doing the most exotic things with all kinds of spices and rubs and fantastic things. But I don't think he used a knife and fork till he was about 20 um, (laughs) because he only he lived on sort of finger food. So I can see the the progression, but it was almost like some kind of phobia. Yeah, what you're describing is reflux. That's what this is. It's it's lengthening the esophagus. I can't remember the name for it, but it's it's reflux, probably undiagnosed. Yeah. Um, and it he probably 
every time you ate, it caused pain. So then you, you developed an aversion. Food causes pain. Therefore, I don't eat. Yeah. And then you would have worked out, okay, carbs are fine. And then gone through the white carbs route. Um, really interesting that you told them the chips were magic because that's how we get first eaters to progress. We tap into their cognitive state and we get them to essentially we're making food fun yeah yeah <laughs> so whatever they're interested in Luke Skywalker made that you know that's the kind of thing that gets yeah. them interested um so that that's just a perfect example love that yeah. thank you for that one <laughs> um, yeah. and then obviously as he's grown and his body's grown he has that that feeling's gone away that reflux is gone it's corrected itself and he's mm. gone on to have an appreciation of food yeah mm. my mum blamed herself obviously like we do we, we blame yeah. ourselves for everything and yeah. she she used to wonder like well did I did I put a hot something too hot in his mouth did he you know she used to question all these things and I know she did ask for help and we are talking we were back in the 80s but she did ask for help and she just didn't get yeah. anywhere nobody nobody suggested reflux um to my knowledge it we just thought he doesn't eat like this is this is strange our siblings did what what was different here but yeah. you know eventually we got there and I've I have seen that in other people um adults and I recognized it in a boyfriend once and thought my goodness you're like my brother um pretty sure he's outgrown it now too but undiagnosed things like reflux could be could have been the the cause that's really interesting yeah, absolutely and I mean I know we've talked more or less today about sort of generic fussy eating but it is fair to say that there are a couple of more extreme forms of fussy eating so one is it's called pediatric feeding disorder and that's often fussy eating that's caused by a medical problem so reflux would fit into that mm. um and they've nearly always got a sensory element as well actually and then the other one is um ARFID the avoidant restrictive food intake disorder um again that these are new diagnoses um but that one is like a mental health diagnosis. So it kind of sits in the eating disorder bit, but there's no like body image associations. And that one's also got a massive sensory part to it as well. So, you know, there are other, there are other reasons why children get fussy eating and children who've got those things, they need professional support. This is not the stuff that you can kind of just read a book and decide what you're going to do to help. They need they often need a, quite a large multidisciplinary team of people to support them. Mm. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, I think I was saying earlier that sensory isn't a medical problem. It's not something that you can be diagnosed with yet. Mm. But I do wonder with these two new diagnoses, I don't, mm. can't say that word properly, um, whether sensory will, um, you know, it might be something that is picked up by the medical profession and people mm. get the right help in time. Yeah, let's hope so. Yeah. Is there any way of telling if you're a parent, is there any way of telling if your little one is fussy due to sensory, due to um, the things we've talked about around cues or whether it could be something that's causing pain like you said I described my brother putting his elbow in the air when he was very little and that that's a reflux um yeah. signal we would I'd never even knew that to this day um but <laughs> how you know what if it was something like even a, a sensitivity to a food is like maybe an intolerance that it's like well I when I eat this hurts and then yeah. therefore they don't how as a parent can we spot those kinds of things it's really really hard so yeah. um that's where that's where you probably need to see someone like me so, mm. so a dietitian but a feeding therapist at the same time so you come in yeah. at it with like two hats on mm. um so like the gps and the health visitors don't have this sort of training um there are um like the occupational therapists and the speech therapists it's all referrals in via you know gps who also may have a um feeding therapy training as well but they don't come with the nutrition part so it's actually really really hard mm -hmm. and I think it's also worth saying that that these there's probably I don't know how many they are for definite but it's less than I can count on one hand centers in the UK that would help with this so it's just so few and far between 
it's amazing, um, Sarah, that you, you know, you're uniquely positioned to help parents with those skill sets that really do complement each other and provide a support that just isn't really available um, mainstream and, and is, is really unique. I honestly wish I had known you back then, <laughs> but that's not to say I won't take on board things you've said and see what I can do with my teen and tween. Yeah, um, definitely. There's still there's still room for manoeuvre. Um, so how can parents reach out to you and get in touch if they're thinking, well, I am at that stage and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to Sarah now before I'm in Lucy's shoes <laughs> with teenagers, um, that are fussy. How, what's the best thing for people to do to reach out to you and what would it look like just so they're not scared? Like how, how do they connect with you and what happens? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I'm really happy to chat to anyone, you know, via Instagram. So you can find me there. I'm the children's nutritionist and I'm really happy to chat in the DMs. That's no problem at all. Um, if they want to talk a little bit more, then they can always WhatsApp me. And I think the link for that is also in my uh, bio and Instagram as well. Um, in terms of what it looks like, it looks like to work with me. Is that what you mean? Yeah, so if somebody reached out to you, um, I'm sure you'll um, have a bit of a conversation back and forth. And then perhaps if they were looking at, well, what, what would happen if I wanted to work with you? I'm yeah. sure you'd discuss that with them on a personal, like one-to-one basis, but just, yeah. for a, just for an idea. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't work one-to-one with clients anymore, unfortunately. And that's just because there's, there's such a huge demand for the service. So now yeah. I have a, a, it's kind of like a hybrid program. So people come in, get a, get um, lots of education that they can work through in their own time. And then from there, we work together as a group for six weeks yeah. um, just to really help implement the advice that they've learned in the program. Um, and personalize it also to their own particular child and family circumstances. Yeah. And actually, since we've been running this program, what we've found is we've got about a 96% success rate. Mm -hmm. So within about six weeks of, you know, doing it, doing the stuff, yeah. um, parents are saying that their children are regularly trying new foods. And because of that, they can't actually label them as a fussy eater anymore. So wow. I just think that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it is amazing that's absolutely amazing I bet it's also reassuring for them now you mentioned that being around other parents that are going through similar challenges so if yeah. they're in that sort of group setting yeah it's funny actually because I think there's I think there's a bit of shame actually that comes with being the parent of a fussy eater because yeah. you, you do carry that guilt and you think you know was it me did I do anything wrong yep. so that's why I'm really very clear early on it's not your fault and so what it means is when when they do come together as a group and we do our six weeks together, um, there is no, nobody feels bad. You know, everyone's really happy to contribute to the conversation, to put their cameras on, you know, to, to, to gel together as a group. So yeah. 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 Oh, amazing. I love that. You're doing wonderful, wonderful work there. I'm really, um, it's been so lovely to delve into it in more detail today and you. ask you my questions. Thank you so much for sharing so much value with our audience and we'll put all your details in the show notes and a link um, to you so that people can explore this further. Um, definitely follow Sarah on her Instagram if, if nothing else, because you'll get lots of lots of tips and tricks there um and then maybe when you're ready you might want, want some more but she's wealth of knowledge here to save our sanity when it comes to getting these little ones mostly healthy and happy around food and it's just yeah. brilliant sarah thank you so so much oh you're welcome thank you so much for having me you're welcome <laughs>